welcome <laughs> to a uh, very warm Zurich office, uh, possibly the warmest day of the year so far, to see the hottest feature of the year so far. <laughs> um, yeah, we would like to give you uh, some updates on the VetKeys uh, progress, let's say. I'm Ashling, I'm a researcher here at Affinity, and I'm joined by Franz Stefan, who has been working on the cryptographic implementation, basically, of the system API and uh, various other things that we will see throughout the uh, conversation. Um, I see some people chatting in the, uh, sending some messages in the chat. That is absolutely great. Please continue to do that, including from Stephanie. You should concentrate. But uh, please ask questions throughout. And um, yeah, any feedback, we are super happy to hear. If there are any bigger questions, uh, we'll collect them and answer them at the end. Uh, but yeah, generally very glad to have you here. And finally, we get to present some interesting stuff. So uh, uh, for the first timers, so this is the second community conversation. There was a first one before, and you can go and join that. But if this is your first time here, um, maybe we can give a little bit of an overview about why we care about encryption or why are we here in the first place. And uh, I think it's no surprise to anyone that blockchains are not really good for privacy. They're very good for integrity and availability, and you can go and check things, and that is great. But uh, for confidentiality, they are not so good. Um, every node keeps a full copy of the state, and in many places, this is like uh, visible to various different entities within the system. Uh, also, Another reason why we care is that managing keys is really hard. So if you ever sort of dabble in cryptography, I guess one of the things that you'll see is that uh, any sort of key management is where a bottleneck often happens. You rely on other services or yeah, it's uh, there are a lot of kind of issues that can come up there. And in a distributed setting, this also gets particularly difficult. Um, with uh, web applications, often keys are stored in browser memory, and this is not very good because it's unreliable, as things get deleted very often, and they're often exposed to various malwares. Um, there is not a lot of support from trusted hardware for encryption, where perhaps there is for things like authentication and things like this, so if you want to do logging in, maybe it's better, but for encryption and, yeah, encrypting data, it's not so, so great. Um, and also cross device syncing is difficult. So suppose I have something on my phone, I have a document and I want to encrypt it and I want to access it later from my laptop or you know, my machine at work or something like this. Um, moving this kind of cryptographic key material across uh, devices is not so hard. So we want to solve these types of problems and we want to open new business applications because uh, I mean, privacy is a thing in the world and it is needed. It is normal, as the Zcash guys say, privacy is normal and it is a part of day-to-day -day life. And without any sort of privacy, we lose a lot of the kind of functionality that we need to do life, to do our day-to-day -day business and to go about things as we should have the right to. So, um, yeah, we, we hope to open a whole host of uh, applications. This is why we're here in the first place. So if you're new, uh, to the conversation, welcome. <laughs> so uh, if you're not so new, if this is your second time, let's say, to hear us talk about a uh, community conversation about bed keys, um, here is some updates and what we will actually talk about in this uh, conversation. So some updates since we last talked. The paper was finished and was released. Greg, who we miss dearly in the community conversation space, um, gave a very nice pres uh, presentation at Real World Crypto. So maybe we can put the links in there, but you'll find it around. And now, uh, as of today, the number of demos are available. And so in this presentation, we want to give a bit of a recap of what VetKeys is, um, set the stage so that you can see exactly how the API kind of came to be and why the demos are the way that they are. Um, and yeah, Franz Stefan then later will walk you through the proposed system API. So you can tell us if you like it, if you hate it, if you think it's 
I don't know, whatever, indifferent. <laughs> um, we hope you're not indifferent, but anyway, uh, let us know your thoughts. Um, there are two demo walkthroughs. One is just the very general kind of end-to-end -end encryption uh, use case. And the other is uh, an encrypted node stack that exists before that was pretty complicated to set up with key management and whatever. So we've updated this with vet keys now to be much more uh, user-friendly and like yeah, minimize mistakes that developers can make. And um, I guess, for you guys as developers or viewers of this talk, uh, one of the more interesting things is that we have some bounties um, that we will launch with this feature in the hope that we encourage you. Ah, oh, Greg, hey, <laughs> um, good to see you. Uh, you'll recognize some of the slides, but hopefully we have some new stuff that uh, will entertain you a bit. Uh, yeah, we have some bounties um, focusing on a few of the use cases that we'd love to see developed. Uh, they are also just to kind of encourage people to pick up the tools that are there now and start building with them and to kind of get a hands-on view of whether or not these are useful for the use cases that people want and need and um, yeah. So there are four uh, focusing on IBE, group sharing, time lock encryption and a general open call. Uh, I'll talk a bit more about that at the very end, so please bear with us. Uh, I can keep the details to keep you on the line for a few minutes. Um, just to note that the bounties, if you're watching this later, will be open until the end of August, so it's basically your summer homework. And uh, yeah, overall, we generally want feedback. As always, nobody really gave us a lot of suggestions about the names, so you're not allowed to complain about these things unless you're willing to <laughs> uh, give us some feedback on what you think might be better as well. But yeah, I mean, ultimately what we really want is to get feedback on the proposed system API. Um, so uh, maybe just a recap on what vet keys are that now that we're here. Uh, it's a tool that we have that uh, enables canisters to deterministically derive strong cryptographic keys. So some of these words we'll explain a bit more as we go through explaining what uh, these things are in a bit more detail. Um, these keys are good for doing symmetric encryption, asymmetric uh, encryption and decryption and signatures and a whole host of uh, nice sort of privacy preserving operations that you might like to do on your data. Uh, these derived keys can be delivered to a canister straight from a user front end. So it doesn't it's never the case. I mean, it doesn't have to be the case that nodes can see the keys, so we can deliver them to you in an encrypted way. And the main use case is basically giving a privacy layer to the internet computer. What we really need in many cases is to have some confidentiality to canister data. Uh, we want end-to-end -end encrypted storage, messaging, social networks, and a whole bunch of interesting stuff. Um, and we want some conditional decryption, so time lock, dependent decryption, dead man switches, MEV protection, and more. We'll see more about that, but I think the main, there was a lot of discussion and Greg gave some very nice overviews of the use cases and uh, even some designs for some schemes in the first co uh, community, conversation, community conversation. So if you wanna go into the details, I will check there. Uh, one thing we've noticed is that sometimes people confuse uh, encryption with generally computing on encrypted data. So here we are just encrypting at rest or decrypting uh, data. We're not doing any computation on encrypted data. That is something different, but we're also working on this. Uh, it's a bit further further down the line maybe, but uh, Victor Shoup is the main uh, point of contact there. And I think um, there was some chat about this in the forum already. So if you want, you can follow up there and uh, bug Victor for, for uh, more details about that. So maybe uh, I can recap some of the intuition that uh, Greg very nicely developed in the first community conversation. And this is that every string is a crypto key. So uh, as I said, one of the main kind of annoyances with developing cryptographic tools or privacy preserving technologies is that you run into this key management issues. 
And there, uh, it would be very nice to just be able to generate cryptographic keys in different places is pretty easily and all of this. So this is kind of uh, what we aim to do with web keys. And uh, in doing this, we take any sort of string and turn it into a cryptographic key. This is the very high level view. Um, and if, I mean, maybe we can talk through this picture as we'll go through various uh, iterations of it throughout the uh, day and throughout the talk and throughout the demo as well. Um, but suppose you have some sort of call where you can derive a key, which takes a master key as input and a derivation ID. Uh, you give it to the subnet, uh, which has a secret shared master key, uh, which is threshold shared over the nodes. Then you can uh, derive a key from the secret shared master key on the subnet. And Note that because we want to simplify key management, we need to retrieve the same key later so that the same user can use it later on a different device, for example. And so for that, we need the key derivation to be deterministic. And so if it's deterministic, then we need, this is why we need an identifier for the derivation. So this derivation ID is the thing that allows the same key to be derived at some point later on. And this master key is the thing that we derive the derived keys from. So this is a very high level view of what is going on. Um, and yeah, like sometimes you hear about this magic uh, crypto moon math that uh, allows you to do some crazy stuff. Um, the, the magic, the crypto magic here is taking a derivation ID, which is just often a name or perhaps a principle or something like this and deriving a strong cryptographic key from that. Uh, so yay, crypto magic. So uh, now that we know, or now that we suppose we can get uh, crypto keys from derivation IDs, which we're calling them here, but from any string, uh, what kind of keys and what can we do with them? So again, we have the same picture, but extending, you can just suppose that a canister can actually do some operations with the key that is derived now. So uh, given that a subnet has a secret shared master key, we have a derivation ID, we can later derive a key for a particular user, maybe on a device, whatever scenario you want to imagine. The canister can then take that derived key and just start encrypting and decrypting things with it. Uh, this is a very simple setting. Um, the string can also be an asymmetric crypto key. So here we want to work in the public key setting. And in this case, you can start from the same uh, place as before. You have a derived key function that you can call on a particular subnet of a canister. The canister can derive a key. Uh, the canister then, as in the previous setting, can uh, then take as input a ciphertext, which is encrypted by a particular user, and then the canister can decrypt with the derived key. So this is a sort of example of where uh, you can delegate decryption capabilities to a canister, for example. Um, so we said before that sometimes it's important that the nodes don't see the key. Let's say, for example, you don't want this to happen. You don't want a canister to be able to decrypt on your behalf. Um, in that case, you want to be able to retrieve your derived key from the internet computer, from the subnet, from the canister. Um, but yeah, you need to do this in a way that preserves uh, the privacy of the key, let's say, so that no one in the meantime can use it. And so in this case, we introduce the notion of a transport key. So on a very high level, once a key is derived, you can encrypt it. Uh, the subnet will encrypt it and the encrypted key will be sent back to you. Uh, from the canister and you can later decrypt it. How does this look? You will do this with uh, by generating a transport public and secret key pair. Um, you'll send your transport public key to the canister so that the canister can then call on the subnet and say, okay, given this person's derivation ID that I know, and now that I have their transport public key, and given the master key, master vet key, key derivation key that lives on the subnet, derive from me uh, this person's vet key uh, and encrypt it under their transport key. So 
this all happens on the subnet. And so what is returned actually to the canister is the encrypted key for that person's identity. The canister then can do whatever they want with this uh, encrypted key, but the best that they can do is send it back to the user so that they can decrypt it and actually start to use it. Um, again, crypto magic here is that taking a transport key and a derivation ID, you get a derived key uh, with privacy. So yeah, extending the example from before, the canister now has an encrypted derived key that it sends back to the user who then decrypts uh, the encrypted derived key and starts to use it for their encryption and decryption wishes. Uh, so how might this look a bit more in practice? Uh, this is what will be shown in the demo. So Franz Daphne will talk through this later, but um, yeah, just to kind of reiterate how you would do this for end-to-end -end encryption. Um, in the first step, you will generate your transport key, public key and secret key. You'll send the transport key to the canister so it knows how to uh, tell the subnet to encrypt your derived uh, key from your identity. So the canister will then call this derived key function on the subnet, which will derive a key for you, encrypt it um, in a decentralized way. So note again that the master key on this subnet from which we're deriving keys is secret shared. So in any case, each node will only see a particular piece of a key. It's never fully reconstructed on the subnet. It's never seen in playing text. Um, so the key shares are derived in an encrypted way and sent back to the canister who sends the encrypted public key to the user who then decrypts the derived key and starts doing its uh, encryption as it wishes. So this is one of the first use cases that you will see in the demo later on. There are a few more, which I'll go through uh, a little bit briefly. So this is also maybe one of the second ones that you'll see. Um, here, it's very similar, but just slightly extended to the file storage situation. So on the first hand, you generate your transport key pair as before. You send a query to the canister to get me, derive me a key, um, and you send the transport public key and your identifier the canister will then uh, call on the subnet to derive a key for this particular identity and encrypt it under this transport public key. The subnet will do this and then send the encrypted key back to the canister, who then transports the encrypted key back to the user, um, who then can decrypt the encrypted derived key under the transport secret key to retrieve the derived key, and then they can do whatever they want. So in this case, we are thinking about encrypted file storage. So with the derived key, we can encrypt a file. Then we can send this file and ask the canister to store that for us under this particular identity such that if later in time we come back and say, hey, I'm Alice, I want to now decrypt that file. I don't have the keys on this other device that I'm now using, so go derive for me my key again that I can decrypt this file. Um, and this is exactly what happens in this case where you have this encrypted file retrieval uh, situation. So I'm now Alice and my step, I'm at some point later in time using a different device. I generate a different transport key pair because now I'm on a different device, I'm doing different stuff, it's later in time. I send a retrieve call to my canister with my new transport public key and the file name saying, give me back this encrypted file that I sent you under this identity. Uh, everything follows as expected. The canister will then call this derived key interface uh, from the subnet, giving the master key ID, the transport public key, there should be a little dash here, uh, and the identity for which it's driving the key. The subnet will do that and encrypt it under the transport public key, send the key back to the canister storage, uh, the storage canister who then sends the encrypted key back to Alice, who can then decrypt the derived encrypted key under the new transport public key to uh, retrieve the derived key, which is the same one as before that she used to encrypt this file, 
which now she can use to decrypt this file and retrieve the plain text file. So this is also uh, something that you will see in the demo. This is the encrypted note stuff. Uh, there's a lot of, I think, somewhat nice documentation for that. It's maybe a little bit out of date, but um, yeah, it's, it should explain the complications of doing this, let's say, without bed keys. Um, so I mentioned that there will be some bounties and uh, I think one of the main things that we're interested to see is the identity-based encryption, uh, interesting ideas for this. So in this case, um, I think it's something that is, I don't know about you, I've been talking a lot, sorry, you're very quiet. But like, I think the idea of identity-based encryption is very nice and I think it is not used enough. Yes. That's True. what our bounties are for. So yeah. we, want to see, we want to see many uh, interesting use cases yeah. where this can be used. Yeah. I think time lock encryption was uh, mentioned as one of the examples <clears throat> that uh, are very obvious, but there might be more yeah. that people care about. So yeah, we have some in mind, but we look very much forward to yeah. what uh, the people, what people's ideas are. And, uh, yeah. In particular, if the system API that we are putting out and that I will, I will show later um, can support all the use cases that people come up with. Yeah, this is exactly, I mean, but first I think uh, even the simple case, uh, Alice, I'm here, I want to encrypt something to you. Instead of me trying to get your key from you somehow or like contacting a PKI or like who knows what's trusted or who knows what kids use these days or who knows whatever. I can just say, hey, this Franz Stefan guy at Definity who I know does this, let me just encrypt a message to him. And this would be super great because there's only, okay, you're lucky your name is not Dominic because there are a number of Dominics at Definity, but if you're Franz Stefan at Definity, this is a pretty unique identifier that I can then derive a key from and send this to you. This would be a very nice way to be able to communicate with you rather than relying on uh, finding your cryptographic keys lying around. Or even easier the principal ID within some application. Exactly. So if I have a principal ID in, I don't know, the chat or somewhere and you know this, then you yeah. can encrypt to it to that and I will be able to see it. So the flow here is similar to before again. So I want to, let's say, asymmetrically encrypt a message to Bob or Franz Stefan, whoever it might be in this case, under the master public key of a particular subnet. So my front end will call to my chat canister. So this is an end-to-end -end encrypted messaging example. So I want to send a text message to you exactly in the case, something like open chat or whatever. I can send a query to the open chat canister to say, I shouldn't say open chat, any <laughs> independent chat app. Well, I mean, open chat is now owned by the community. So this is a... Uh... True. Uh, so yes, we can send a call to the community owned chat canister to uh, derive a key for Bob's identity, uh, to encrypt the message to Bob's identity under mine. Then, uh, when Bob wants to retrieve the message, he'll say, okay, retrieve this key under my transport public key and my identity. So this is the same as the file retrieval case as before. Um, the canister will go through the same process with the subnet of saying, okay, derive for me a key for Bob under his transport public key, send the encrypted key to the canister, the canister sends the encrypted key to Bob, Bob decrypts the ca uh, his uh, encrypted derived key under his transport public key to retrieve his derived key under which he can then decrypt his message that Alice sent to him using his identity. Um, so yeah, like you can see this in the bounties and there are lots of other similar use cases like end-to-end -end encrypted email. It's very similar to the messaging case. You can also extend it to social networks and many more. So uh, in the end, we'll come back and talk about bounties, but on the bounties page, you will see a lot of these use cases. So we would love to see this kind of stuff uh, show up. And with that sort of introduction, I will hand you over to Stefan and I'll stop talking for a little while. Thanks. 
Thanks a lot, Ashley, for the recap uh, of this uh, feature that, uh, yeah, I find very interesting and very happy that I could work on this and create some demo that I'm sharing now. So let me share my screen and take the presentation. There's a lot of chat. Great. I see some people are already started to answer questions in the chat. Thanks for that. Okay, so to the demo part. I want to start with a disclaimer, <laughs> or actually three disclaimers. A number of them. Um, so the first disclaimer I want to make is that at this stage, whatever I'm going to show, um, whatever we have implemented so far, is all based on a proposal for a system API that is not uh, that accepted yet. It's like a pull request on the interface spec repository that is open for everyone to comment on to see. So this is what we have in mind, what we propose, but all everything is just a proof of concept for now and um, theoretically anything that you will see could still change um, and at this point for us the focus is really on collecting user feedback on on the general approach and in particular on the api that we are proposing to see if this fits the needs of the community um, the, the resources for full implementation of this, so a full integration into the Internet Computer Protocol. So there are no resources for this committed yet. So just be aware of that. So that's the, the first disclaimer. The second disclaimer, and I've seen questions about this on the chat, is that the timings that you will see in the demo are not yet representative. For example, because the demo at the moment doesn't uh, have any crossnet calls, which are inherently uh, time, time consuming. So if and when this feature will be integrated into the, the protocol, the timers will be different. Um, we expect that the latency will be very similar to the latency of the threshold ECDSA feature, if you're familiar with that. Um, at the same time, we expect though that the throughput will be higher because the protocol itself is uh, much more efficient. So that kind of gives a framing of where the performance will be, but um, yeah, please don't rely on the timings that you see in the demo. We do have some benchmarks on the base library that we implemented. Um, there are also some benchmarks in the paper that is published, but we're uh, at the moment, consolidating all of this, uh, looking more deeply into the benchmarking and hopefully we'll have uh, more accurate results on this very soon. Right, and the third disclaimer is that uh, the current implementation of the system API that we are proposing uh, is obviously, it's not integrated into the protocol. So what we had to do was create a mock implementation that obviously is insecure. It's insecure in the sense that it does run the right, the correct protocol, but it uses a master secret key that is baked into the canister that we built for this. And uh, therefore um, anything that is used to encrypt with this is considered not to be secure. So the source code of this, uh, as I will show later, is, uh, pub is public, so you can use it also for local development, but do not use this in production or for sensitive data. And of course, later, when, if and when this will be integrated into the protocol, things will be secure because um, the underlying key will be created in a distributed manner in a way that no node will ever see the, the full key. Okay, so this brings us to the first demo. So there are two demos that I'm gonna show. The first one is very basic one that has very little functionality by itself, but it, it makes use of all the necessary building blocks that are needed to build an application with this. 
And the three building blocks that we need are um, an implementation of the system API, which uh, as I said, is uh, at the moment um, an insecure implementation. Then the second building block that we have is a example backend app canister. Um, recall the slides of the encrypted key derivation. Basically what, what the demo will show is just encrypting in the browser some text, some plain text into a cipher text and then decrypt it again. And this is what's happening in the front end. So what we will make use of in the front end is a, what we call that kitty user library. So it's a, a library dedicated for the code that is supposed to run in the front end, so in the browser. And this, we implemented the actual library in Rust. And the way we are using this library in the browser, in the front end, in JavaScript is via uh, WebAssembly bindings. So we compiled this into a um, NPM package that contains a WASM file uh, that executes all the necessary crypto logic in the browser. And the reason we did it this way is because there were no um, good JavaScript libraries that we could find to basically that, that implemented all the crypto, cryptography that we needed. So in particular, like um, operations on the BLS 12, 381 curve. And what, yeah, what we'll see now in the demo is, um, as I said, very simple. So we utilize our library to derive an AES key from a VET key that we got from the backend, that the backend got from the system API. And then we'll use this AES key with standard web crypto API that's uh, available in JavaScript to encrypt and decrypt some, some text. So now let me share. My other screen. I thought I um, do it this way. Okay, this way it's working. Okay, so on the front end, this looks very, very simple. So when I click this button, what will happen? And I will show exactly what happens in the background later. So that when I click this button, what happens is that the front end will now go to the backend canister and ask for its symmetric key. And the symmetric key that it asks for is specific to the caller in the front end. In that particular case here, the caller is just the anonymous user. But if we integrate some uh, authentication solution like an internet identity, then the, the caller could be any principle that's authenticated with internet identity. And then this key will be specific to that um, authenticated user. So every user will have their own key, their own VAT key. And then from that VAT key, an AES key is derived. And this is what we now display here in the browser. Obviously in the real world, we shouldn't display um, AES secret keys, but for the purpose of this demo, it just shows that we have the key now here locally in the browser available to be used. And now that it's here available in a JavaScript variable, we can use that to encrypt and decrypt things like, um, I don't know, some text that we enter here. And obviously this is super fast because it's all local. The key is already there. We make use of web crypto API. This is the cipher text that's produced and I can equally just um, use the key to de decrypt this. And of course I, I get back the same text. Okay, so now to the interesting part, what happens here in the background? Um, let me share my browser again to show you the system API that this is based on. Seems like I lost my browser, so I just reopened it more. Okay, so here we have the um, 
pull request on GitHub where the change is proposed to the interface spec where we add the respective section in the uh, management canister. So I, I can actually show a compiled version of this. It looks a bit nicer here. Uh, preview. So if we scroll down to the IC management canister, at the very end, there is a new section, threshold key derivation. So this is the API that we propose. Um, right above is the API for the threshold ECDSA signature uh, feature. And if you look carefully, in it, you'll see that actually the two APIs are somewhat similar. So somewhat similar in the sense that both offer a way to get a public key and then to do the actual um, thing you want to do. So for threshold ECDSA signing, for threshold key derivation, it's retrieving an encrypted key. So let's start with the API for retrieving the encrypted key. Um, Ashling was talking about the derivation ID before. In the actual system API that we're proposing, this is slightly more complicated, but not much. Basically, the derivation ID is now a package of two things. It's a derivation ID that Ashling managed, but also a public key derivation path. So you can view the derivation ID that Ashling talked about before, like a, or these two things as, as, as a package of this. Um, what the, the public key derivation path is used for is here is input in the VETKD public key function. So why do we need public keys? Public keys are generally used for two things. So when you retrieve an encrypted key, you wanna be sure that what you retrieved is actually the correct thing. So what you wanna do is you wanna verify, and this is actually the, the V in VET, verifiably encrypted threshold key. You wanna verify that what you got from the subnet is correct with respect to the parameters that you put in. So you can use the VET KD public key API to derive a derived public key based on some canister ID and the derivation path and this key ID, which is the same for threshold ECDSA. So you can think of this just as a combination of curve and the name. And in particular, we envision this for the curve to be PLS12381. So it's just an enum. And the name will be, I don't know, key one or key two. I think we all have had for threshold ECDSA, we also had a test key. So um, the key ID will basically uh, be a constant. I guess there will be very, very few such keys so, and therefore identifiers. But both APIs take the key ID as input because all derivation is done with respect to a key that is identified by this. And there will be, these keys will be generated once at the beginning when this feature is deployed um, in a secure way. And then this will remain, will remain fixed. So I said the, the, the public key is used for two things. So for verifying then that what you got back from the canister is actually correct. And the, the second thing is that you can also use this feature in a way to actually do BLS signatures. And when you do that, the public key derivation path will also be relevant. Um, BLS signatures are not the topic for today. Um, at the moment, we don't directly support this with the library, but um, just keep in mind that this is another use case of how the public keys can be used. Okay, so the API has this package of derivation information consisting of the path and the derivation ID, then the key ID, and now the interesting part is the encryption public key. So when you retrieve, as Ashling said, the key from the internet computer, you want to make sure that nobody else can see it on the way. So you generate this transport key pair locally. We will later see how. And here you input the public part of that key pair so that uh, the subnet will, or every node will encrypt their share with respect to this key. And then uh, the combined form will um, be encrypted then in the same way. 
So yeah, very few parameters. Um, derivation information consisting of path derivation at e key at e public key and the uh, and the public key info two. That is for now only really needed to verify the information uh, that you get back here. Okay, so now we have an implementation for this. Um, let me share the respective. Window here, so that's my Visual Studio Code for an example that is already published in the Definity Examples GitHub repository. So it has the name MedKD and it has a source folder with basically three subfolders a backend, a frontend JS, and system API. And the system API implements the API that I just showed. So if you look at the red kitties, it's just an API candid file. That's exactly what we've seen before. And uh, here in the library, red kitty public key, red kitty encrypted key, that's exactly the API that's implemented. And this is what's called by the app backend. So if we look at the app backend, in our example, the app backend has also two methods. Again, one related to the public key and one related to actual retrieval of, of the key. So how does the re retrieval of the key work? Again, you just input your transport or encryption public key. And then what the, what the canister does is it just creates a request that is later made to an implementation or the, the insecure implementation of a system API um, where as parameters it uses in the derivation ID, the caller ID that is making the call. So as I said before, every user will get their principal specific key. And the distinguisher here is the, the actual caller. So the, the internet computer will make sure that you can only get your key. Uh, for the public key derivation path here, for the purposes of this example, we just use, um, so this is a, a vector. We use a vector with one element and the one element is just uh, the string symmetric key because what we're gonna use this key for is deriving a symmetric key. So we basically want to domain separate this key uh, or the, the canister is domain separating this key and kind of marking it as, okay, this is to be used for symmetric key derivation. But this is really use case specific. It could be anything, um, it could be some, some, some other text. Um, yeah, what's, what's relevant is that in our other method, the symmetric key verification key method, we use the same derivation path. So here we also used uh, the string symmetric key. And for key ID, I said, uh, it's just the identifier we're gonna use for the curve, wet, wet curve BLS 12381, and we call it test key one. That's what the system API at the moment supports. Okay, now with these two methods in the backend, how does the front end look like? The front end is implemented here in JavaScript. And uh, next to all these buttons that you have seen, there are actual relevant, there are th three relevant methods. Here. So one is to actually get the key, get the AES 256 GCM key. That is called when I click the, the first button you've seen. And then uh, two methods, one to encrypt a message with the key that I retrieved and uh, one to decrypt. So how does, and now this is the really interesting part. How does it work to get my key in the front end? So first I need to create my transport key pair. Um, for this, we have, as mentioned before, created a, what we call user library. So the user library is called IC Vetkitty Utils, which contains all the utilities that one needs exactly at this point in the demo in the front end deal with retrieving the key. So you need to generate a transport key pair, which, which is done here with uh, WebKD transport key 
keeper constructor, which takes a seed. So where does the seed come from? Um, from the web crypto API by just creating uh, 256 bits uh, as input for the transport secret key constructor. And just to be complete here, where, where does this web kit here come from? That's just a node module uh, that's imported. I see that kit utils. And if we look at the respective um, section in the um, the configuration here, we see that I see you at kitty utils here is actually linked to a file that is also part of the repository. So namely this file here. So this file here contains the WASM module that I talked about before. Um, we did not publish this yet at uh, npmjs.org because the API is still somewhat in flux. I would say we want to stabilize this first before actually pushing pushing a version. If we have uh, suggestions there, please please let us know. For the time being, um, it's just checked into the repo directly. This is also public uh, publicly available. The source code for this. Um, the links section later in in the slide set, and I think Ashling, you will create a forum post or something with all the links relevant for today. Uh, they will, this will be included. So the source code for this lives in the, um, on GitHub in the ICE repository. Okay, so jumping back to the part where we get the key. So we now have our seed, uh, some, some random value that we use to create our secret key, transport secret key. And now we just call our backend method, the encrypted symmetric key for a caller with the public key part of that um, key pair. And theoretically, then we already done, then we already have the key. Now we want to make use of the key. And as I said before, um, when making use of it, we at the same time want to verify it. So to verify it, we need to retrieve all the information. We need to gather all the information that we need to verify the key. So what do we need? We need the respective public key, which we can also get from the backend canister by just calling the respective method, which here is called symmetric key verification key, which will use the same public key derivation path that also this method uses. Um, And then we need, as I said, the, the canister used the caller's identity as the derivation ID. And for verifying, we want to verify with respect to a derivation ID. So we also need to know what that principle um, is. So we just ask our, um, our agent what our principle is and store it in this variable. And then we have all the information we need so that we can then make use of that key. So how do we want to make use of that key? We want to decrypt it, at the same time verify it, and in our use, in our use case, you want to turn it into a symmetric key, in particular into an AES-256 GCM symmetric key. And we have a very generic function here that helps us with doing all of that at the same time. So, it's called, it's a method on the transport secret key that is called decrypt and hash. And it takes the encrypted key, the public key, the principal, and then it asks how, how long should your key be? We say 32 bytes. And then we also domain separate it. We say, okay, the key that we will use that key for AES-256 GCM, GCM uh, encryption. So we kind of just tell the API, what's the scheme we're gonna use this for? And that's basically for proper cryptographic hygiene. So we don't mix keys that are uh, uh, for different purposes. And when we call this and this succeeds, we will have our 256 bit key, AS key that we can use now. And the encrypt and decrypt buttons that I showed before, they, which are called, or these are the methods that are called by these buttons, um, just make use of that key now. So 
here, when we click the button, we store it in a, in a variable that's stored in a global variable here, fetch the metric key. And this is given then to these encrypted decrypt functions. So that's the input here and the message that is input. And then again, um, we need some random data for encrypting initialization vector. Um, we load the key into a web crypto API object. We encode the message UTF-8. Uh, UTF-8 encode the message so uh, we can encrypt it and then we just call the standard web crypto API for ASGCM. And all that's left is to package the cipher text with the initialization vector together because those two things need to go together. So um, we package it up and uh, what you've seen before was just the package hex encoded and then we can decrypt it in the same way. So I think I covered now all the building blocks for this very simple demo that I showed before. And now to finish, we have a slightly more involved demo that is what Ashling mentioned, uh, the encrypted notes tab. Let me find my presentation. There it is. Okay, second demo. So this applies all the billing blocks that we've seen now um, to the node storage use case. And you may be familiar with the original encrypted node step, which is also an example that on in the examples repository. And it's basically an app for authoring and storing confidential notes or confidential data on the, on the, on the IC. And the way this step does it is that notes are encrypted with principle specific AES keys as well. But the difference is that um, they are generated locally and stored locally. And the because per user, there is only one AS key. You need a way to synchronize this key across multiple devices. So how is this done? Then every device generates another key, like a key pair, an RSA key pair that is then used to um, encrypt this key and store it in the backend canister. And then there is some logic that synchronizes all of this. So it's it works. This is secure, but it's a bit of a hassle to manage all these keys. So with the VAT keys feature, this is much, much simpler because all I need to do is ask my backend canister, hey, give me my key whenever I need it, and I'm done. There is no device management um, needed whatsoever. So what the demo that I'm going to show it now is, is doing is it, it took this encrypted node step, ripped out everything that was needed, replaced it with VAT KD, basically the same things that you have seen uh, in, in the first demo, but it's much more comprehensive in the sense that, that there is authentication with internet identity and uh, notes, notes are stored in the backend and uh, you can retrieve it with, with different devices uh, and so on. So let me quickly jump into that. Okay, so this is the starting page. I now log in. I created this identity before. It's just some uh, development version of internet identity. I authenticate with my D. And now here is an initialization phase. So before the UI loads, in the beginning, the VET key is retrieved and the AES key is derived in the same way that you've seen before. But now we can now we can use it here to um, actually create notes. So we can add a note and say commit conversation to store it. Uh, we can add another note. And the encrypted version of these nodes are stored in the backend and the front end just decrypts them in the front end 
and all of this um, can now also be easily seen on another device. So if we, if I pull up another browser, which is here Firefox, and I log in with the same internet identity, I should be able to see the same nodes. There they are. And uh, I can even change some of them. And then it's encrypted locally, stored in the backend. And there you see already in the other browser, uh, it retrieves it automatically um, from the backend. And as you can see, if you know the original encrypted node step, there is no device management button here anymore. So there was the original app, there's a device management button where you have to manage all, all devices and browsers and so on. And um, here that's not needed. And that's, yeah, I think really, really nice feature. Okay, let's see. If there is something else that I want to mention. Yeah, if you want to have a look at the actual code, uh, again, this is also public. It's called encrypted node step vet KD. Um, there is a PR, the draft PR that I opened, which shows the exact diff between the two versions. So if you're interested in, uh, in the diff, We'll also make that link public or, or just ping us and we'll, we'll make it available to you. Yeah, uh, here are some links. So the system API proposal I showed, we have the implementation of that. Everything is on the github.com Definity examples. Uh, one is the original, the first demo I showed is in on the Rust Vet KD. This also includes the insecure system API canister implementation in Rust and uh, the encrypted node step using VetKD is in the Motoko folder, but it actually supports both Rust and Motoko um, with environment variables. And the user library is, as I said, in the Definity IC repo in the folder packages I see VetKD utils. And there's also some developer documentation on internet computer org, uh, developer docs. And then I think there's a link in guides and advanced features. Yeah, I think that's it from for the demo part. Back to you, Ashley. And maybe uh, if you want to just go to the next. Uh, thanks. Very nice. There's a lot of yeah, questions and people are happy. Um, but we're running over a little bit. So maybe I'll just spend a minute talking about the bounties. And then do you have time to stay? Do you want to talk about, talk through the questions? Uh, I think we can take some. Yes. Yeah. Um, anyway, there are some bounties. Um, there are four in particular that we hope to see. Um, each of the bounties has a, a prize pot of uh, the equivalent of uh, $6,000 in ICP. Um, they're uh, competition-based, I guess, this is what it's called. Um, so yeah, we pick the best uh, entry for each of the four use cases and award those some prizes. Um, ultimately, we like this feature a lot, and uh, people like me like to see a lot of privacy stuff being built on the IC. So if you do nice stuff, there's quite some likelihood that there are follow-up grants available. So um, yeah, this is just the kind of first step. And really, the main point is to try and get some feedback and to ex expand the examples repo, basically. Mm -hmm. And the three use cases are around identity-based encryption, group sharing, and time lock encryption. And there's an open category, do what you want to go nuts. Um, yeah. Uh, maybe I can actually just share my screen for a moment and show you the uh, bounties page. Because um, I think there's a lot of, we try to include a lot of information there about um, 
like some of the things that we mentioned today, uh, yeah, like a lot of these things that we mentioned today, there are some like extra bonus suggestions. And a lot of these things have been described in the previous community conversation. So if you need inspiration for stuff that you'd like to do, go here. If you don't need any inspiration, go nuts by yourself. If you want to team up with other people, um, yeah, feel free to join some conversation in the forum as well. Um, yeah, there's the list of links to the uh, stuff that was shown today up here. Uh, there is some other reference links down here. So, I mean, a lot of information is there. Uh, and yeah, there is the QR code if you're still on Zoom. So please, oh, and the main thing is that these bounties are open until the end of August, at which point there'll be some deliberation amongst us or, uh, I don't know, we need to ask Dominic Werner how did that works, but yeah, I'm sure we'll find some way to pick some great things. And really looking forward to the submissions. <laughs> yeah, curious to see. and. Um, I think there have been quite some interest already in some, so yeah, we would be great to hear. And if you have any questions, yeah, there's like a lot of questions in the chat. Uh, I'll stop sharing and maybe we can talk through some of them now. Um, so yeah, thanks for joining us and we look forward to continuing the conversation on the forum. Um, so let me go through a few. Andrea has been like on absolute fire. Uh, answering questions in the Fantastic. chat in Zoom. But for the people who watch this on YouTube later, uh, maybe it's interesting to go through some of the main ones. And I think um, also the only person uh, keeping up with Andrea in terms of typing is Jordan Moss, as always, with uh, a lot of interesting questions. And I think the first one was about what are the security risks of decrypting within a canister? And Andrea responds that until we have SEV and SMP subnet, you know, you can consider that non-confidential. And so on the one hand, this can be quite threatening, you know, okay, like don't decrypt anything in the canister because you lose all privacy and then your thing is in the clear again. And that's the whole point that we're trying to get away from. But uh, do it's you not think as bad. It's, yeah. it sounds. <laughs> do you think, I mean, are there cases where it would be interesting to decrypt in the canister? Um, I guess ideally not, but uh, some use cases, I don't know um, if some were mentioned directly in the chat. Um, I guess we built this, also the user library so that we have all the tools that everything can be done in the front end. So as much as possible should be done in the front end. Um, one thing I remember from uh, earlier conversations was about this MEV protection. So suppose right. I want to send some s transactions and I want uh, I don't want them to be intercepted in some time period. Uh, I don't want my yeah, transactions to be ordered in block or ordered across blocks or anything like this. They can be encrypted for some time and then later decrypted in a canister. This is those kinds of things maybe are one example of when this is like actually great. Mm -hmm. uh, is the API available in DFX yet? Um, I'm not sure. So the API is, um, it, it's implemented as a standard canister that anyone can implement. So we just took the API that we proposed in the interface spec and used the same API in the canister to be implemented, and we just use that as part of the demo. And instead of calling the system API through the various means where usually system APIs call, we just make a call to this canister that we also deployed as part of the, um, the demo. I think and, this. Uh, in that sense, it's available um, within the effects if you make it part of your, of your application your example application that, for example, you, you use in, in the bounties. So I would say yes. Okay. Um, what is the 
fault tolerance. I mean, how many key shares would you need to be compromised from the total to be able to break this? Um, this is still to be decided. That's exactly uh, what Andreas is. <laughs> I'm checking if you... Uh... Because, so at this point, we just defined how we want the feature to look like for developers. It's not integrated yet into the protocol. But once it is, we need to make certain decisions on what the exact guarantees are. Um, we have made some decisions in the past, for example, for a threshold, you see they say um, the conclusions might be very similar. I guess we want uh, like a threshold of two third eventually of the nodes. Um, so a very high threshold, um, but the exact details are, are still to be decided. Is this something that people could help us decide? Or are we the experts on this? Um, I guess we want the most security out of this. I think the highest we can get, uh, we will aim for. Um, it might have some implications. On cost and time. Exactly, but um, I don't think we'll compromise in any way on security there. So I think we'll aim for the highest threshold we can get because we know that if we bring this feature, it will be used for sensitive data and we can just not compromise there. So I am seeing Jordan uh, saying 100% fault tolerance would be great, thanks. <laughs> um, another question, the transport key is ephemeral. So I think this is- Yes, um, I forgot, I, want, I meant to mention it, I forgot. So this is super ephemeral in the sense that um, if you remember the piece of code that I've shown, so it's just these maybe 10 lines of code. So this is the necessary lifetime of the transport secret key. So you create it, you fetch, you use the public part to fetch the uh, red key from the backend canister. And once you have it, you can throw away the key pair. You don't need it anymore. Um, and next time you get the key, you can use a different uh, key pair. You should it's really just for transport. Exactly. Like if you're taking uh, the metro to go home, you don't care if it's the same train the next time. Right. Uh, <laughs> nice analogy. Being encryption on the subnet level, I'm curious about the processor overhead, the encryption and decryption is introducing. It's sounding like symmetric encryption would be the better fit. So yeah, what's the processor overhead? So as I said before, the, the underlying protocol is, for ex especially compared to threshold VCDs, for example, it's very cheap. So um, we don't expect much uh, much issues in that regard. And uh, as I said before, the, the the throughput we expect is definitely much higher than for threshold VCDs. But the latency will be very similar because there will be cross net calls involved to likely similar to what we have now for threshold ECDSA, there's a dedicated subnet or a subnet that does very little other stuff and is very secure, and has a lot of nodes. Um, <clears throat> and you need to call out to the subnet and therefore you have a cross net call and you need to wait for the response. And um, unless we deploy dedicated VAT keys for the various subnets, which I guess we could theoretically do, but ideally we want to have as few keys as possible so that we have as few keys to protect as possible. Um, yeah, unless we do that, then uh, the crossnet latency will be there. Mm. But I guess then you can somehow work around this by designing your application in a way that you retrieve the key. Uh, uh, in what? As, as seldom as possible. Um, yeah. And um, one thing, what is it needed? What is needed to extend the file storage to allow access control so they can share the file? I think is this this is covered by the encrypted node stuff, right? Because so it, it is at least the way it was shown now. 
it is already uh, access controlled in the sense that only the person authenticating can get its its own key. So every every authenticated principal will get a different key. Um, so in that sense, there is already separation uh, between you. So you will not be able to see other users notes, but what you can think of is a scenario where you want to share notes across principles. So for example, you want to, um, you, could do the, you could do this with IBE, but you could also do it with the tool set that we have seen already by crafting the uh, derivation, path, derivation ID or the um, public key derivation path in, in a way that you kind of encode which users are allowed to see this key. So you can kind of form a group. So we define principle A, principle B, make it part of the derivation path, uh, derivation ID respectively, and then only people that are part of that derivation ID are actually allowed. So the canister would have to implement some logic to make sure that he gives out the respective key only to principles that appear yeah. in, uh, in the respective derivation ID or derivation path. I guess this is what we would expect to see at least in some of the bounty applications. It's exactly this kind of Yes, technology. exactly like that. That would be fantastic to see it. Um, some people building that. And this would fall into the group sharing. <laughs> exactly, that's the group sharing uh, bounty section, the bounty category that we have. Uh, somebody says, any ideas when OpenChat will introduce end-to-end -end encrypted messaging? I would love it. We have no I clue, would, actually. I would love have that. Um, I, I just say this should... out loud so that the open chat guys feel some pressure to. Uh... Right. Actually, I mean, now that open chat is a DAO, go and start campaigning for your proposals to uh, put a proposal to the open chat SNS to say implement uh, encryption, end to end mm -hmm. encryption. Um, how expensive is this feature going to be? This was a bit mentioned already, right? Uh, yes. Um, I don't know if this was answered already by... It was answered by Andrea in the chat, but just even like in terms of what you mentioned before, that um, in terms of deriving the key, it's relatively cheap given that it's threshold PLS, but yes. I mean, putting everything in context, um, it will end up... so. Andrea says regarding the cost, at this point, we do not have suggestions for how much it's going to cost, but we it, hope it could be cheaper than threshold ECDSA. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be the goal, yeah. This should be, because the throughput should be higher than threshold ECDSA. On the other hand, we also need to take into account the cost for NITKG, so, uh, which is used to generate the master key and that we have to run to refresh the shares. This is- Yeah, this is run repeatedly. Um, so everything's running canister. Do, do what curves will be supported? Um, BLS twelve three eighty one will definitely be uh, supported uh, in the beginning. This is what's implemented at the moment. We have the BetKD library in the IC repository that uh, builds on this curve. Um, so I would say for for quite some time, just this curve. Um, okay, so I can verify all derived keys with one single public key for a, give a specific derivation path. So I think uh, there was some, some chat at this point around the verification. Right, so if you remember the API also has a canister ID in there. It's optional, so if you do not provide a canister ID, then will just default to the canister of the color, but you could put in somebody else's canister. So if you have like a, I don't know, multi-canister application or, you know, some other application that, uh, where you know the canister ID from, you can put that in and then the key will be derived with respect to this um, canister ID. And maybe worth a mention that regard is also that for the API that gives you the encrypted key, um, I don't think it has the canister ID in there, but it's it's implicitly baked in. So all the keys are derived 
with respect to the information you put in via the API, which is the derivation information, the derivation property, but implicitly there's also always the canister ID in there. So um, obviously this is very important, otherwise you could um, see the keys of other canisters. So, but, uh, and I think I've seen a question on this in, in the chat. So canister ID is part of the derivation. All right, um, like we're quite over, so maybe one last question. Um, how is this going to be set up? So are there going to be a small number of dedicated subnets with master keys, just like threshold ECDSA, or will the subnet that the canister is a member of hold the master key used to derive the keys from that canister? So will every subnet be- uh, Having its own- Bestowed, yeah. Uh, Again, to be decided, so this is the part of the integration into the protocol, we need to make decisions there. I expect in the beginning only a very small set of keys, most likely just one in a dedicated secure subnet. Um, but if we see that the way people want to use this feature um, so that this architecture imposes too much latency, for example, but you always need these cosmic calls. Um, I guess it can be discussed whether we introduce a few more of these keys, but yeah, as I said, every key we generate, we need to protect and back up and the, the fewer we have, the better. So easier. If, yeah, exactly, if, if the, the usage of the people allows to have just one, uh, I guess that would be, that would be best, but, I guess that's part of the whole um, feedback round now to figure out what people need, what people want, and uh, then we can, in the integration phase, take all, all of this into consideration to make sure uh, we make, yeah, we address the actual needs of the community and uh, have a product market fit. So to Jordan's dismay, you agree with Andrea, but uh, maybe to Jordan or someone like that who has opinions about how this should be, maybe it's interesting to outline why it's interesting to have uh, a red key, master key on every subnet or this is, uh, there are pros and cons for both. So one what, very last question and then uh, the chat has actually slowed down. I think people are, we are like melting here <laughs> and then we go outside. Uh, can this encryption be used to encrypt and decrypt gigabytes of data? Thinking about a use case in which somebody has information which is used to train AI models and wants all their training data encrypted. So first disclaimer, <laughs> uh, if you have training data and you want to do AI stuff, I mean here the encrypted would just be encrypted, like storing it at rest. I mean, you cannot do computation on this uh, so it's not very useful for AI, well, yeah. Anyway, so can this be good for large amounts of data? Um, depends on your scenario. If you, I mean, the key that you derive with our system API, you can do with it whatever you want. <laughs> if uh, your application supports, for example, in browser encryption of such big data and then storing it somewhere, ideally on the IC, uh, but again, <laughs> storing such big data may be a challenge. Um, theoretically, yes, but um, yeah, AI models uh, I'm not very familiar with, so I don't know how big they are, probably <laughs> very, very big. Um, cool. So maybe we leave it there. Uh, thanks for the very nice first look at super versatile keys that you can derive. Um, any questions people can, yeah, talk in the forum, look at the bounties, look at the docs. Uh, we'll put the video up soon. And um, yeah, we look forward to see what you work on over the summer and giving us something interesting to play with as well. Yeah, um, really looking forward to the feedback. And uh, if you have any questions, more questions that uh, were discussed now, then please reach out in the forum or by any other means you see fit. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Ciao.